Hey everybody, Tom's here. And today we're gonna to talk about a very important subject that has come up on many videos. I've done videos of this in the past and I've also seen this on Facebook. Um, but before we get to that, I wanna say happy Thanksgiving everybody. We're up here in Wisconsin. First Thanksgiving we've had up here, having a blast with all the snow and everything. And it's a rather warm day today. I think it started off at 29 this morning and it's gonna be warming up into the 40s. So that'd be pretty nice for the kid to get out here and play. All right. Back to the story at hand. The story at hand is we've been seeing a lot of people posting, hey, I've got this brand new mill or I've got this mill that I just picked up from someone else and I cannot get it to cut straight boards or my boards are dipping and diving in certain locations or, you know, it's thinner on one end, thicker on one end. What's wrong with my machine? Help me out. And what I'll say is I don't care what kind of mill you have, whether it's the, the cheapest you know, hobby mill out there, like the, the most entry level mill there is, or the largest industrial mill out there, a bandsaw mill. If you do not have a good foundation, then there's no possible way you can cut the best quality lumber for you and or your customers. So foundation is key. Now I'm going to talk about things on here that I have correctly set up a mill. I'm going to talk about things that I do not have correctly set up. And we're just going to leave it at that. I don't have everything perfect on this mill, but I have everything close enough to what I need currently. And what I mean by that is the most ideal situation to be have a to have a concrete foundation in this mill to make sure I'm, you know, nice level base to work off of. But I am working off the ground and then there are some issues there and but there are things you can do to mitigate uh, those issues that do pop up. So first things first, you see these ad fine adjusting jacks. There's six of them around the mill. There's three on this side. And there's three on the other side. You got them at the end here, at the middle, and at the very stern of the mill. Currently, this one right here is set up probably the best. And what I mean by probably the best but not the best is I have a board that extends from the left side of the mill to the right side of the mill, one contiguous board. The only problem is it's a thin board. It's a, it's a one-inch thick pine board. Preferably, it'd be good if you had like a, a two-by piece of material, preferably hardwood. doesn't have to be hardwood, but hardwood would be better. But that helps to distribute your load across so that you're not getting any low points or, or such on there. If you put your jacks directly onto the ground, then you will have a point loading onto the ground. And the ground, especially in this area here, will freeze and thaw, freeze and thaw, whatever. And over time, as you're putting logs on there, off there, you will get some you know, some type of migration into the ground, AKA it's going to bring your mill out of kilter and it will not be true. So having a solid board that runs from side to side is a proper way to do this. If you're cutting on the ground. Now, if you're traveling with your mill and you're cutting at different job sites, you know, would it be okay for a day or so just on the ground? Sure it would, but over time, it will, as you load logs on there, take logs off, you know, the mill moves back and forth. It's going to start working its way into the ground. It's, it's the vibrations of the sawmill will start to work into the ground. Now it won't do a whole lot. I mean, you will still cut rough cut lumber, if you will. However, over time, you're going to have to start, you'll, you'll start noticing some issues with your mill. Maybe when you're cutting, you'll have some boards that aren't touching on all your bunks or something like that. And that could be because of settling that occurs at different rates along your uh, foundation of your mill, AKA the ground. So if you're running a portable mill, um, that has wheels and everything, you have some sort of arrangement with, of jacks or something like that. If you're running a stationary mill, like say a, uh, a Timber King 1220 or a LT 15 wood miser or woodland, uh, umpty Scott, whatever that doesn't have wheels. Then again, you may want to put that on a concrete foundation, but if you can't, a, a good thing I've seen people do is they actually build uh, a framework with uh, six by sixes or something like that and bolt it down. And the reason that would be good is because then it would uh, prevent your your mill from sliding across the ground. But even if you, if you can't do that, the best thing you could do is, is to put some type of board that runs across, uh, left to right. So that this one here is quasi correct because I have a board there. It's just not the right thickness. If you go to the middle section of the mill, I have these smaller pieces. It's about a, a six inch or so by 12 inch piece of pine. It looks like, and that again, helps to distribute the load. But it's not ideal because 
even that over time can start to settle in and there could be some movement. And back aft, I have the same kind of thing, except I have some two by material. So at least I have some thicker material, but again, it's, it's, it's increasing your surface area to the ground, distributing that load so it won't sink in. Also, I don't know if I have this right. Hopefully, no, it's settled over time right now, but technically you want your wheels up off the ground too. Now this wheel here is a little bit touching. I believe the other one over there is off. I know that sounds funny, but by keeping those wheels off the ground, it does help to keep down some vibration. You can get some weird vibrations on there, but over time you'll get sawdust and wood and stuff like that gets underneath there. So yeah, it's not a must have, but that right there can influence some type of bending moment on your structure. So it's best to point load where she should be point loaded and not where she should not. All right. So we've done that. Now let's go ahead and look at the level. And you can see she's running pretty good there. I don't see... Come on, focus. There we go. Running pretty good. I, don't, I wouldn't make any adjustments there. Also, left to right, you want to make sure that you have a large enough level to do this. And you want to make sure you're going to the same, quote-unquote, height of structure on both sides. So, on this side right here, I've got the rail that my uh, saw head runs on. And the same thing on the other side. And I'm not putting it you know, lower on one side than the other because that will influence the bubble. We we'll look at the bubble, and she looks pretty good right there as well. So I'm happy with the left to right there. And then you'll do this throughout the length of the mill. And I've already done this, um, but just for safety's sake. So again, she's sitting good there. And then now I have a log across here right now, so that doesn't help. But I can go back here where the saw head is, put it right there as well. And yes, she is sitting good and level. I'm I'm sufficiently happy that my mill is leveled and that I'm properly distributing the load down to the ground without causing any areas that can uh, settle on me. Okay, next thing's next. I'm gonna show you a good indication, that's why I have this log on here, that your mill could have some type of issue or maybe you have some buildup. So if you look at this 14 foot long six by, I think it's like a six by 10 or so oak cant that I have on here. I've got good connection right there on this um, uh, cross member. The next one down, I have a slight gap. Let's see if we can show you this right here. Slight gap right there, but no, it's hard to see. The reason that I have that gap is because of this right here. I actually have a bit of sawdust that's built up on there enough to cause just a little bit of a gap and that happens what i'm cutting out of this i'm cutting more rafters such as this so i'm not really too worried about about a 16th of an inch air gap underneath the, the wood that's due to sawdust but with a hydraulic mill the cool thing is is you have these tow boards fore and aft if you're cutting something that's really you know critical that you have the best possible cut cut and everything and as you're turning the log, every so often, it's a good idea to bring your tow boards up, lift the log up, and clean your bunks off. Sawdust buildup on your bunks can cause your cants to be slightly off. It's, it's just a you know, fact of nature. You know, if you put something between two objects, it's going to cause your measurements to be off. Very simple, but it, you know, I don't know of any mill out there that doesn't have that issue. It's just something you have to check for. A small amount's okay, a large amount, especially like a piece of bark, would not be okay. Okay, so we've talked about foundation. Foundation is key. Once you know you have a level playing or platform to be working off of everything, then you can start working on your saw head. So, I've already moved my, my one guide roller out all the way over here. So this guide roller, roller's all the way out, and I don't have really any induced movement on this blade now the proper way to check your blade is to get a blade alignment tool or something like that that'll extend out the blade a longer distance and it'll give you a more accurate reading however here's the the quick you know down and dirty version we're going to go ahead and find a straight tooth it could be a you know between a tooth but this right here looks to be a straight tooth and first things first all right, let me get where you can see it. I'm going to clear off the surfaces. Find our straight tooth again. Right there. 
And then we're going to look at this. And that level right there indicates that my blade is in fact level. So I'm happy with that. The other measurement you'll do is going to be left to right. And she's pretty good there as well. It looks to be a little high bubble to the, uh, the right side of the mill there, but not enough really where I'm too worried about that. Something that can also induce that measurement to be off is if you have any buildup on these guide rollers right here. So right now I'm running diesel, and as you can see, I don't really have that much buildup that's on there. The reason I'm running diesel is because it's wintertime up here, and I don't want to be freezing my water tank, but I need some type of lubrication to make sure that things are going well. So if you have a lot of buildup on your guide wheels, that can cause your blade to have a lope to it, meaning the blade will be going up and down, or if it's fully caked on there, it could add a little more tension to your blade and have your measurements in the down direction to be off a little bit more. But what I'll say is that's not a lot of influence. That's a little bit of influence, but really that's not a lot. You'll get more influence from whether or not your blade is properly set and sharpened. Um, but we'll get to that here in a second. So we've looked at the blade level, left to right and forward to aft, it looks good. Uh, another thing, if you don't believe me, on a straight tooth, you can go, let's see, between the teeth or anything, and we get the same reading where she's good and level. Anyways, I have high confidence that my blade is in fact level, and my mill base, my platform, is in fact level. So there's no reason it should be dipping or diving based on that. Another thing, on a Timber King sawmill, now I can't really show this right now in this video, but from the bottom of this wheel to the bottom of this, there's about an eighth of an inch difference. So what that's meaning is these guide wheels right here are pushing this blade down about an eighth of an inch. And that allows them to have the proper amount of pressure uh, to spin these guide wheels. When it's nice and cold, you gotta be very careful because this grease in here doesn't like to spin. And then you can begin to, as you're you know running the blade and everything, if you're not seeing these spin, you wanna make sure you're you stop the blade, come over here, and get these a few spins because you will develop, you can, I said you say you will, you can develop a flat spot on there. If you have a flat spot on your guide wheel, then potentially it could cause, again, a lope to your blade. Also, it's a heat buildup thing. You just want to make sure everything's spinning as it should. That's something to watch out. You might want to get a hair dryer on this in the morning time, warm up that a little bit before you start spinning your full time. Also on the belts right here, so this is Timber King, Timber King runs belts, so this is Wood Miser, Cooks does not. But if you have excessive buildup on here, that can cause your blade to kind of run funny as well. It could, you know, take off some pressure off of here, off this guide wheel here, then it could actually influence your cut a little bit if you have a whole lot of cake buildup on there. You see that a lot of times when you're cutting southern yellow pine or something like that, something that's got a lot of sap. And that's another reason why you want to run either pine saw or, or uh, Dawn or something like that in your water system. Or, like what I'm doing right now, is running a diesel drip. Now, there are some people that are adamantly opposed to diesel drip. Some people say that they're, they're for it. Whatever it may be, whatever camp you're in, I will say, if I'm cutting really, really nasty pine, I will run a diesel drip. There's just no way around it. Also, it keeps your sawdust uh, build up low, so you don't have a lot of build up in there. Plus... If you're running really heavy water, you get a lot of buildup in there. And then you also, once it clogs up, your blade and everything's passing through all that built up sawdust. It's making a big mess with sawdust everywhere. It's also adding heat into your blade. Heat into your blade is the number one cause of failure. Now, I know this is not accurate here as well because I'm, I'm outside the, uh, the area. But if you put your level on your saw head, so this, this black portion right here, this is the frame. Technically, you'd want to put it, um, well, regardless. Uh, what I'm trying to say is also check your saw head. Another way you can do it, a more accurate way, I guess you would say, is you take your, your saw blade here, your saw head, move it over a bunk, and then you'll go, you'll measure between your, your bunk and your saw blade, and if that's off, you'll go up to the top side here on top of these chains, and you'll adjust that up or down to make sure that you get your saw head in a level position. All right, another important thing I often talked about on many forums is blade tension. So this is a Timber King sawmill and Timber King sawmills, they typically, there we go. They, my, my finding is 
with Timber King Ultramax blades or even the Cooks Excel blades or the the Kennesaw blades or any most blades that I run, I run, run, I run around 1100 PSI. 1100 PSI works well and you have this fancy dancy uh, pressure gauge. Now not all mills have this and what I'll say though is you know how do you know you know where your blade should be running well on many mills they have some kind of indication whether it be like a cam system that says hey bring it till this touches there or a line system you know screw this in until you see the, the mark there and what i'll say is yes that's all fine and dandy on the blade that the mill was intended to run now if you are running a different type of blade aka maybe a blade that's not from the manufacturer and everything every blade is different if you look at um timberwolf blades They've got a really cool article on, I think it's like the six, six rules of, of sawing with bandsaw or six, six rules of something. But it talks a whole lot about blades and the tension you run and the, 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 the air gap you're supposed to have, the ratio to sawdust to air and the cut and how much, um, you know, set in your blade, this, that, and other. Really good read. Um, but also with their blades, they say, hey, based on this mill, because they run a different, they run a some type of metal. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but they say, hey, based on your mill, you should probably run on the low end 800 PSI on the high end, whatever that may be. Um, and it's interesting. So what I'll say with that is whenever you get a new mill or a new blade, excuse me, and you're cutting, try that out. If the blade is traveling in your wood a whole lot, maybe run a little more tension. Fine. Not every blade's the same, different materials and stuff like that. So just try different tension. Sorry, I had to take a quick pause there to cough. <laughs> Cleared it all out, though. All right, so we were talking about blade tensions. Um, like I said, if you try a new blade, run it on your machine at whatever, say, the manufacturer initially said on your machine. If you're seeing, you know, waves or whatnot, or if, if, it's, if the tune doesn't sound right, try tensioning it up or detensioning it. You know, it's, it's up to you. You can run your blade at whatever tension you want to. These machines can handle a lot of tension. Now, I talked to Timber King about this a while back. I said, hey, what tension should we be running? They said, well, way back when we did some studies, we used to have people run the blades, you know, upwards of, you know, 2,000 PSI, 1,800 PSI, and as low as 900 PSI. And what we found is somewhere around that 1,100, 1,200 range was pretty good for most of their blades. When they ran a higher pressure, the cut quality is great and everything, but they started seeing premature failure on bearings and stuff like that. Now, I know there are some wood misers, especially on like the LT50s and LT70s. They're running pretty high pressures. I'm talking, they're running up there, maybe in the LT40s. They could also cut really, really fast, but they're, I, I want to say they might be running as close to a 3,000 PSI or something like that, and your blades can handle that. And when you're cutting like that, I mean, it, it does a phenomenal cut, but you're also cutting typically faster. Um, so take it with a grain of salt. If you do run more pressure, uh, there's potential other parts on your mill that you can wear out. So like I know Baker, they run their blades at very high tension as well, but they are also set up with giant bearings and the way that their wheels are set up is quite amazing. On most bandsaw mills that are at the, the entry level, hobbyist level, or even at the, uh, you know, small business level, you probably don't need to be running over 1800 PSI. And there are some probably people that are saying, oh my goodness, I run way higher and it does way better. Whatever. Whatever you find works for you, works for you. I like to run 1100 PSI. I know I get a lot of blade life out of my blade and I know I'm not putting a lot of stress on my bearings. So that's why I run my blades. All right. So now we're going to look at this log right here that I recently cut. Now this is hard. Now let me tell you how hard this is. This is a red oak tree that I found here on the property, and I recently just cut it down. It was standing dead for a number of years. Some ice just fell off the ceiling. <laughs> it was uh, standing dead for a long time, and it is pretty hard. And the blade that I have on there, this is a blade I've sharpened before, and I, and, uh, I don't know, I, I probably have probably 400 or so board from this blade. It's towards the end of its life. And we're going to look at the cut quality first, and we're going to talk about a few things, and then we'll go from there. So cut quality looks pretty good. I am seeing a little bit of tear out and everything, so my blade is starting to get a little bit dull. But if we look at the wood, 
she's level there but really when we look down on the actual let's see if we can get a picture of this look down the actual contact between the uh, level and the sorry that tags in the way now it's not if you look at the contact between the two there's no dips and dives now we're going to come out here to this section where the knot is and there is a little bit of a dip there. You can see a little bit of air gap there. That makes sense because, as you can see, we have a hard compressive knot that was right here. So if I got a little bit of movement there, I'm fine with that. Not, not enough to really write home about. So I feel confident that my mill is cutting great. Now, one thing that does happen is on uh southern yellow pine this is a good example that a lot of people say they they hate cutting southern yellow pine and i understand i've cut a ton of southern yellow pine when i live down in mississippi and in tennessee but up here we don't really have southern yellow pine and there are some differences between the pine we have up here and down there southern yellow pine when you go from a soft wood portion so the soft wood on southern yellow pine is something around 350 so psi worth of compressive strength that's how much load it can handle before you blow out the wood somewhere in that range but then if you go to a knot section the knot section is as hard as say white oak which is around uh 1200 psi before you have a, a blowout or something like that so you're going from 350 to 1200 psi in a knot section what i mean by knot section is if you have a branch like this that's coming out of the wood you can go from very soft wood to very hard wood. When it encompass, when it hits that hard wood, it can cause your blade to migrate up, down, or wave, or something like that. It's just like going through here. We're going from, aka, softer wood that's nice, straight grain, no knots, to a hard section where we came into a crotch. This is a section that I know was going to move on me. And if you look at the blade marks here, the blade marks are a little more indicative because it's putting pressure more on one side as it cause that blade to rise up or down so you'll get a few more uh, extra scratch marks on that that's a good indication if you start seeing you know say the whole log you see a little bit of um chatter with your blade and everything and then towards a section where there's a knot you see a lot of chatter that's because your blade did rise up or rise down and you're getting more pressure on one side of the blade based on which way it went so where was i going with that oh yes so if you're cutting southern yellow pine there's a trick you can do. Now, if you have a blade that is perfectly sharp, that is perfectly set and everything, it's brand new, odds are it won't really do that much on you. But as you cut, continue to cut with that blade, it will dull out over time, then you're going to be more prone to movement. But the trick is, is you put the small end of the log facing your saw head. Okay, folks, rather than try to use my hands and everything, we're going to use a real world Example right here. This is a, our little prop if you will. This is a piece of red pine But as you can see you have a branch that grows off that that branch is growing up at an angle in the upward direction Going against gravity as you can see we have a little bit of snow and ice on there But anyways, what I was trying to explain was as the blade is traveling down the length of the log You've got no knots down below here. It's it's you know, there's really no influences on it one way or the other It's just cutting through wood because it's what a blade's gonna do as you get to this section right here, so this branch probably exceeds down somewhere in this range right here, you'll start to say, hey, I'm entering into something hard. I don't, it, it's, it's going to want to follow the path of the hardness, so it's going to rise up a little bit until the, the rise up is overcome by the tensile strength of your blade. So your blade is going to rise up, take out any slack that there is in the blade, and then it's going to pull itself down because... The only other option is the blade continues to bend and then it will break. And sometimes when you hit a knot, you will break a blade. But the blade typically will pre will prevail over top of the wood, hopefully. So as it goes into there, it goes up. It's trying to follow the path of least resistance. So it's trying to stay out of the really hard stuff right up until it over is overcome by the strength of the blade. Then it pulls through. Then it's going to dip on you. And it's going to go back to where it should have been in the in, in the previous entry point on this side. So that's what it does on that direction. If you're cutting from this direction right here, you know, it, it's going to cut right into the wood. It may try to dip on you a little bit, but based on the steepness of the angle, it's more apt to just stay into that cut 
and follow through. So it's always best to have, now this would be the small end, that would be the big end. It's always best to have the small end closest to your the head of your sawmill. Hopefully that makes sense. And if we look at this piece over here, you know, this shows you again, you've got a, a knot right here, which is right here on the bottom side, it's right here. So you could see at the angle, see the difference in my two fingers there, center point there, center point there. You know, just over one inch of thickness, it's a difference of about an inch and a quarter or so. So you've got the angle of the wood going this way. If you're cutting this way, it's more apt to go right through it uh, than, you know, than trying to diving down. If you were cutting this way, which would be, excuse me, if you're cutting this way, uh, it's going to want to try to follow that hard path up. And you can see the grain around it. The grain gets really tight around there. So it, it's actually starting to sense something way back here in the, in the tension of the grain. So it's getting tighter and tighter and tighter, and then it gets really hard. This goes from something that's about 300 PSI uh, compressive strength to something that's nearly, that's, that's over 1,200 PSI. The knot of a pine is just like cutting a white oak or something like that. So that's why typically when you're cutting in pine that's knotty, that your blade likes to migrate through the log because it's going from softer woods to harder woods and your blade wants the path of least resistance. But there's only a point at which least resistance uh, is taken until the, the strength of the blade supersedes the uh, wood. So typically, like I said, metal should prevail over wood, but not always. A lot of times you will get a, a knot, a, like a big crotch section. So if you're cutting a big crotch section on a tree with a blade that's pretty old, it's more apt to break in that big crotch, crotch section than anywhere else in the tree. Okay, so I'm trying to think, what else have we not talked about? We haven't talked about the blade itself. And then we're going to go inside to my sharpening area to talk about the blade and how a blade will influence your cut. So I think we've gone over foundation, we've gone over your wood, we've gone over your bunks, we've gone over your blade alignment, we've gone over tension, um, and speed of cut. So speed of cut, and we'll talk about that before we go into the shop real quick. Speed of cut. Uh, I've got a lot of people say I cut too slow and I've seen other people cut too fast. Uh, speed of cut is, is, is a personal preference. Um, if you're cutting for a business, you might want a faster speed of cut. If you're cutting for, you know, quality of wood, maybe a slower cut, but however, a slower cut can go against you because it will migrate, uh, slower. And anyways, it can cause some weird stuff. It also does take out the set of your blade faster. And the set of the blade is something that's really important. We're gonna get inside and talk about that here shortly. So stay tuned. Okay, folks. Now we're inside the shop here where I do my setting and sharpening of the blades. And you may have seen this. I did a video on this recently. This is a dial indicator that'll tell you the set uh, in your blade. It's a clamp on dial indicator. Pretty nifty tool. First things first when checking the set of your blade, we're gonna go ahead and zero her out. Go to the kind of the center part here. Yep, good and zero. And we're gonna check a couple of these teeth. Go to up tooth, about twenty thousandths. Let's see, there's another up tooth there, twenty thousandths. And let's go to the up tooth. Right there, twenty thousandths. So that's reading pretty consistent. It's a little bit lower. Now this blade has been sharpened, but I have not set this blade because I wanted to see. Hey, can I get by without doing a setting in between? So we know the one side is 20 thousandths. And let's check the bottom tooth. Bottom tooth here. That one's about 18 thousandths. Uh, bottom tooth here. 19 thousandths. And bottom tooth here. 18 thousandths. So not too far off it's within the two thousands tolerance or anything um, i could probably get by with running this blade as she is now yeah i i, I probably will just run this blade one more time the next time i sharpen this i can expect the bottom probably to be off more than the top and that kind of does make sense because the the top portion you know the blade is already being pushed down an eighth of an inch from your band wheels to your guide wheels. So she already has tension in the downward direction. So the downside of the tooth is gonna have 
it's, it's less likely to go down, more likely to go up. If anything, this blade would rise, rise going down. And it's going to take out a little more set down there because, again, it, it's, it's resisting going down because there's already pressure in the blade that's going to take your set out a little prematurely than it would on the top. So the path of least resistance would be the upward direction by the downward direction. All right, so set. If, you're, if your set in your blade is not enough, now, there's a few ways you can tell this too, but if your set is not enough, now, when you're first running a blade out of the box, it's sharp. Now, this blade's been sharpened. It is sharp as all get out right now, probably sharper than when it was brand new. So sharpness is good. You can, you can tell that by doing your nail test or just feel it. You can feel a blade whether or not it's sharp, and you can kind of look at the structure of the face and everything. It looks like it's good and clean. The set, you can eyeball it and say, yes, I can see a visible set in there. But a good indication is when you're sawing, look at your sawdust stream coming off the exhaust side of the mill. If you have a solid, steady, straight, or steady stream of uh, sawdust coming out and it's not floating off, that's a good indication that you have proper set in your blade. The set is what's going to, you know, determine how far off from that center line your teeth are running. If you are, if you don't have enough set, you're not going to cut out the wood in that that set portion right there that uh, that delta right there and you're going to have a lot of fine particles coming off so if, if you see fine particles coming off of your mill that means you're not getting enough air into your cut and you're not getting uh, enough material removed so you're seeing all this this dust kind of fall, fall off that's also inducing more heat into your blade it's going to cause premature failure of your blade so don't run a blade past you know when the set should be you know, re when the blade should be reset. And really, to tell you the truth, that's about 15 thousandths. What I like to say, I, if a blade's anything less than 15 thousandths, it's definitely got to be sharp. And the fact that this one's 18 thousandths on the bottom side, that's even lower than I like. I like to set to 22 thousandths. I, I find it to be a pretty good uh, set. I've seen it as high as 28 thousandths, 30 thousandths if you're cutting really soft wood like a white cedar or um, a white pine or something like that. No problem there. But if you're cutting the hardwoods, you want to say a little more a little less set, excuse me, um, because it's it's going to be putting more stress on your blade because it's having to rip out more material and therefore causing more buildup in your blade. But 22 thousandths is a really good set that we found uh, going forward and we, we over the time, I should say, we, we really enjoy using 22 thousandths plus or minus two thousandths. So yeah, I'm close. I'm a little bit on the low end on the bottom side here, but I'll run this blade again and probably just cut some softwood with this. Um, Okay, so you want to make sure you're seeing a solid stream of sawdust coming off. If you're seeing a, a dust come off, then it's, it's not really set, so you need to go ahead and take it off. If you do not have enough set in there, like I said, you're building up heat and stuff like that, but also it doesn't give your blade any kind of guidance. When it's offset like that, it knows how much material to take off. If, if you don't have it in there, your blade might want to kind of wobble through the wood some more because it, it's not taking a clean path with it. You have nothing that's that's leading, it's, it's only following based on what the grain structure it has. Whenever it's a wider cut through there, you know, that center rake or tooth there, it knows how to travel right down the path of uh, least resistance because there's nothing in front of it. If there's a lot of material in front of it, then it's gonna follow the grain structure. Hope that makes sense. Okay folks, hopefully this video was helpful to some of y'all and everything and don't give up. I'll say that too. Like sawing your own lumber or sawing wood, uh, opening up a log, it's very exciting. It's a lot of fun. It's it's the way that I relax and everything. It's really been my release in life and everything. I, this is my passion. I love this stuff. I'll also say I do not know everything. I know a lot of things about a lot of things, but I don't know everything. I'm not the end all be all, nor do I you know claim to be. But um, I have run a sawmill since about 2003. I've learned a lot of things from trial and error over the years or anything. And I'll, all I can say is I've made a lot of mistakes, but I try to learn from my mistakes. So hopefully this will help some of you all learn without having to make those expensive mistakes over time. So just to recap, we're gonna go over a few things. Foundation, the foundation is key. Make sure everything is level. Without that level foundation, you cannot cut good lumber. Saw head level. Once you have your foundation level, work on your saw head, and with that also your blade level. Uh, blade level can easily be adjusted uh, through the guide rollers or through the adjustments up on top, 
or whatever your machine might have as an alignment. We also didn't talk about blade tracking. Blade tracking is a thing. Um, it's a little more complicated to explain. I'll have to do a video all by itself on blade tracking, but you want your the center one third of your blade to be traveling over the center one third roughly of the, of the wheels and everything. Uh, but there, uh, that'll be a whole other video down the road. But blade tracking is a key. Um, we'll have to get some more information on that. Guide rollers, make sure they're properly adjusted and there's no buildup on those guide rollers or on your wheels of your sawmill. Uh, pitch. Pitch is nothing. We didn't really talk too much about it. We did a little bit. Make sure it's not built up on your guide rollers and wheels, but also make sure it's not built up on your blade. Especially if you're cutting something that's got a lot of sap in it, like southern yellow pine, it will build up on your blade. Run some type of lubricant, whether that be diesel, uh, water with soap, water with pine saw, um, antifreeze, whatever that may be, or not antifreeze, uh, anti-icing stuff, your windshield wipers, whatever people may run. You want to make sure you don't have any build up on your blade. Build up on your blade can also induce movement through the wood. Uh, your saw blade sharp and set properly. If you have a dull blade, it's gonna just not cut that great. You'll be putting a lot of extra wear and tear on your machine because it's working harder as well as on your blade. You'll have premature failure. We typically get five to six sharpenings per blade and take a blade off when she's properly dull or when she's uh, the set's been taken out of it. The set, 22 thousandths is a set that we like to set our blades to, plus or minus two thousandths. Uh, anything outside of that, um, we might do based on the, the, the cutting that we're doing. So if we're cutting something that's very soft, maybe we increase that set a little bit more so we can get a little more runtime on that blade. But uh, 22,000 plus or minus two is kind of like the, the margin like to stay in. And also the orientation of the wood you're cutting and the wood that you're cutting. Not all wood is the same. There are definitely harder pieces of wood than others. Um, so if you're cutting Osage orange, uh, and if, if it's dry, yeah, good luck. That's that's some hard stuff. I've cut that uh, quite a number of times or I think it's one of the hardest woods out there that I've cut. Live oak. Live oak is an interlocking grain oak. Very hard to cut. Uh, some of those ones, you got to make sure you have a really brand new blade, good sharp, good set, and you're cutting slow because you're cutting through some really gnarly hard stuff. Uh, woods like that, I do tend to typically charge uh, more if it's someone else's log they bring to me because they are so hard to cut. So. Just to give you a rundown of a few of them that I've cut that are really hard, Osage Orange, uh, Mesquite, um, Southern Yellow, excuse me, uh, Southern Live Oak, even some really knotty Southern Pine that's got a lot of pitch in it, that's hard to cut. Um, and then Burls. Burls are really hard to cut and anything that's got a really big wide crotch, uh, like Pecan or Hickory, those are also really hard to cut. So again, hope you found this video uh, enter entertaining or at least informational, maybe not so much entertaining, but informational. Also another thing we, we really didn't talk about, these machines, they've gotten quite expensive over the years. They've always been expensive, but they've gotten even more so expensive due to all the COVID stuff. Make sure you're properly maintaining your machine. Uh, a properly maintained machine typically does tie into a lot of things we're talking about today with alignment and stuff like that. But if you keep your machine well oiled and you wait till everything you know, warms up to operating temperature before you use it, that'll also help a whole lot. So please like, subscribe. I appreciate you watching this video. Hopefully it'll help some people out there. If you have any comments, please write them down below. I know I didn't cover everything. These are just things that I typically see on a day-to-day on -day basis when I'm cutting. So stay safe out there. Happy Thanksgiving again, and we'll see you around. Thanks.